In this video, we're going to take a look at how to use a JList in Swing and populate it with a series of Java objects. So a JList is used to show a collection of data. We will associate that data with a JList by using the setListData method. Now, an important note about this is that it accepts a vector. Now, a vector is a lot like an ArrayList, but vector actually predates ArrayList. Vector is thread safe, and what that means is you can have multiple processes running and they will cooperate with a vector. So effectively, you can't have two threads into the vector at the same time. ArrayList is not thread safe. Now remember, I mentioned that vector predates ArrayList, so it kind of feels like we gave something up with ArrayList, right? Not necessarily. It, collections are used all over the Java development system, and in the vast, vast majority of cases, those collections don't cross thread boundaries. So the vector, while it does provide that thread safety operation, it's rarely used and does add a performance hit. So the ArrayList was created la later in the life of Java for the vast majority of cases where we need a collection, and it is a bit more performant because it doesn't have to do all that thread checking. So just a little bit of background if you're not used to what a vector is. It's a similar story with hash table and hash map. Hash table came out first and is thread safe, where hash map is not. But nonetheless, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the JList. So let's go in and do an example. We currently have this swing-based form where I can select a type of vehicle, I have Sonic, Prius, and Mustang, and then I can populate certain values like odometer, miles per gallon, and gallons of gas, and then hit save. The trick is that all we're doing is collecting the data and storing it, storing it into an object, which I did in a previous video, but we're not actually doing anything with these objects that we're creating. As a matter of fact, the data we have in here is just some dummy data. So I'm going to remove that dummy data and I'm going to populate this list with the objects that we're creating. And as an added bonus, what we're going to find is that as the state of the objects updates, in other words, the value of their attributes, the list will update as well. First, to get rid of that hard-coded model, I had populated it here just you know, like so. So I simply need to clean this out. Now back to our controller, remember that we need a vector to store our objects. We'll declare this up where we have our attributes. Just like an array list, a vector accepts a generic argument. Now remember that we can store in here a Prius, a Sonic, or a Mustang, or any other future vehicle type that we make. And what they all have in common is that superclass called vehicle. So when we define the vector, let's go ahead and define it to that superclass type. And this follows the dependency inversion uh, principle of solid, where we want to rely on abstractions, not concretions. And we're really just calling the go method on each of these objects, which is available in that vehicle supertype. So for the generic type, we simply put vehicle. And let's go ahead and do an import and call the constructor for vector. If we take a look at the action performed method here, you notice that it's tied to the save button. So this is effectively what happens when we click that save button. And you notice that we're gathering the data from the form. And then we use a factory method to create the appropriate vehicle object type. Could be a Sonic, a Prius, or a Mustang. And store it in a variable of type vehicle, which, guess what, very much intentionally matches what we want to store into this vector. So now we give us some space down here, and we'll say all vehicles dot add vehicle. Now we need to associate this vector with our list. We have a reference to our list uh, right up here, LST vehicles. So in the constructor for driver form, right after we initialize the combo box, let's go ahead and say LST vehicles set list data. Notice that it wants to take a vector, and we'll say all vehicles. So at this point, when we create the vehicles, we should see them in the list. Now, there's one other thing that we can do, which is going to be kind of fun. If we take a look at our form, we know that we can put in a number here and then press drive. Now, I noticed that button's a little bit small. I mentioned that on a previous video. I was able to fix it on the save button by simply bumping up the minimum size and preferred size of the button, which I'll do to this drive button as well. But nonetheless, what we want to be able to do is enter some number in that text box and then press drive and simulate each of these vehicles driving. So for that, I'm going to return to our form. And you know what? Let's kill two birds with one stone here. Let's go ahead and fix that drive button uh, to a better minimum size. I'm going to give it a minimum size, or let's say maximum size of 90. 
a uh, minimum size of 90. And that way that button won't resize when I simply move it from one monitor to another. And 90, there we go. And then uh, after that, I'm going to right click and say create listener. And once again, action listener, which is effectively a button click. And we choose OK. Notice it gives us this action perform method, which is where we put the code or the logic that we want to execute when that button is pressed. Let's start by grabbing the distance that the user has entered. Now we're going to parse it to an end so that we can do some math on it. Now we want to iterate over all of the vehicles in that collection. And we want to run them the certain distance. Now there are two ways we can do it. We can do it with a traditional for each loop, which is how I've done it in many examples up to this point. Or we can use the streams functionality in Java. Either one will work just fine. Uh, just to try something new, I'm going to try it with streams. So we say all vehicles, which is our collection, then dot stream, which means we want to shake hands with each of them, or, or we want to make them available. And then for each means we want to shake hands with each of them. Uh, now, when we're shaking hands with them, what do we want to do? Well, this is where we can use a lambda. So remember, we're shaking hands with every vehicle in the collection of all vehicles. So when we're shaking hands, we're shaking hands with a vehicle. Let's store that in a variable called vehicle. And then we we'll use the arrow the uh, dash and the, and the greater than symbol. And then we're simply entering a lambda expression to say every time I shake hands with a vehicle, run this operation on the vehicle. And it's simply going to be vehicle dot go and then distance. Easy as that. So you see this uh, stream and lambda is really nice if you basically have a for loop where you're just executing one line because you can then do this all in one line. Now, okay, big for loop, you're probably going to want to use a traditional for loop for that, uh, big for loop body that is. But if you just want to say, hey, uh, shake hands with each vehicle and while I'm shaking hands with it, pass this distance into that method and then we're done and then I'm off to the next vehicle. Well, this all vehicles collection dot stream dot for each and then this lambda is a good way to do it and what we're saying here is this is the vehicle I'm shaking hands with and with that vehicle invoke go and pass in distance and semicolon now just a couple more things we need to do first of all let's nudge that list and tell it to update its UI be careful make sure you say update UI not just update and we want to do the same thing after we add a vehicle to the list. In the form, I want to give the list vehicles a minimum size because the problem right now is it's zero, zero, and we're starting with an empty collection. So it's going to say, oh, I don't need any space at all. So let's go ahead and give it a minimum size. Let's see, we'll say 400 pixels wide and maybe 100 pixels deep as a minimum. Let's make that the preferred size as well. Now, ideally, we could solve this by using our, our, our fluid layout, um, you know, have it stretch and do all that boundary. But it gets a little confused if... It's trying to render the whole screen, and it says, well, I don't know how big this component should be. So we'll give it a minimum of 400, 100, and a maximum of 600, 200. Now we have our program running. Let's go ahead and create some vehicles. So Sonic will say 10,000 on the odometer. We'll say uh, 25 miles per gallon, maybe 12 gallons of gas. And notice when I choose save, it appears in that J list. Now, Remember what it's actually rendering here, because we see odometer 10,000, gallons of gas 12, warranty phone number, so on and so forth. Well, what it's doing is it's invoking the two-string method of this class, which gives us that friendly output. If you're getting something weird like a package name dot class name and then an at symbol and six characters, alphanumeric, that's because you've not overridden that two-string method. So very important to override that two-string method if you want to display the output of this in the JList. So we start with our Sonic. Now we go to our Prius. Let's say the Prius has 25,000 miles. It uh, gets maybe 50 miles to the gallon and has 8 gallons of gas. And now let's do a Mustang. Let's say the Mustang has 35,000 miles. Uh, maybe the Mustang gets 15 miles per gallon and has 16 gallons of gas. And so you notice at this point that we have three vehicles in this list. Now, 
watch what happens when I enter 100 and I and I hit drive. Oh, that is awesome. Did you notice that the user interface updates automatically? And that's where object-oriented programming is really important. Because remember what I am using to display in that J list. I'm passing in a vector, but a vector of what? A vector of vehicles, not a vector of strings. It's really tempting to say, oh, can't I just put a string in there? Because that's what the user's going to see anyway. Well, the value of using an actual object is as that object updates, the J list updates as well. If we just took some plain old string and threw it in there without it being an object, uh, we'd have to go back and manually update that. So, you know, again, just reinforcing what I'm talking about here. We see driver form. We have our vector of vehicles. Okay. And then we are creating a vehicle. We're adding it to that vector. And then we're just telling the J list to update itself. And we can continue to do this as much as we want. So if I want to make another trip, for 50 miles, you'll notice that the odometer will increase and the gallons of gas will, will decrease. And let's say I want to new, do another trip with 100 miles. And once again, the UI continues to update automatically and instantaneously. And all we had to do is put the right collection of objects in there and then invoke that update UI method. So this is a look at JList and Swing. As always, I hope this video was helpful and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.